Hello, uh, my name is Winston Wu, and um, this is a video message for Daryl Sloan. Now, um, you and I have corresponded um, a lot in the past, and I've been watching a lot of your videos lately, okay, and they're very interesting, and um, it, it's great to hear your um, perspective and critical thinking, but I noticed that in a lot of your videos, you you kind of like only see like one slice of the pie, but you miss the in, the entire pie. It's like you, you only see one or two pieces of the puzzle, but you you miss all the other pieces. And I've seen that as a pattern. I mean, I mean, it's like what I've noticed is that you focus on one or two arguments, but you ignore all the counter arguments to um, from the other side, okay, and I've seen that in a pattern as a pattern with several videos, okay. So it's like you're you're cherry picking or or selecting data or, or having some confirmation bias where you only want to believe what you want to believe, and if you don't want to believe something, then you just wave your hand and dismiss it or ignore it. Um, and I don't know if it's by mistake that you do that, or if um, if you do that on purpose, because it seems like you're really intelligent and educated. So it's hard for me to believe that um, that you would miss, you know, obvious things that a lot of people know. You know, I mean, even p someone who studies theology or, or metaphysics or the paranormal. Even an average person that studies those things, I mean, they know certain things, okay, that it, it that seems like you don't take take into account, okay, um, and so I wanted to, to talk about some of those things and and hope that you'll maybe consider um, these things that you're ignoring, and so I, I mean, you seem too intelligent to ignore basic simple things so I, I get the sense that maybe there are certain things you, you don't want to believe so you, you just make some excuse and just dismiss it all you know and just wave your hand and say oh all the evidence is for that is gone I don't see it I ignore it you know or, or deny it all and I don't know I mean it just seems I mean correct me if I'm wrong but it seems like if you want to believe something you just ignore all the evidence for for the contrary um, and I've seen that in, in a number of your videos, so I thought I'd try to talk about that and try to get to as many as I could. Um, I mean, as many as I can. So, the first thing would be Christianity, I guess, since you talk most about that, okay? Now, I agree with you about all the contradictions in Christianity and, um, the struggles you've had. I've had the same struggles I've written the exact same things back in like um, the early 2000s or something. I, I've written the exact same things about Christianity that you have um, in your videos. So we have a very similar path on that. But the thing is, um, the difference is right now it seems like you see Christianity as, as completely negative with no value at all and no truth. And, and that's how you come across in your videos. You, you act like it's a terrible thing, and, 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 and it does have terrible things in it. It has a lot of extreme beliefs and contradictions and things that just don't make any sense, and, and we've gone over that for many hours, and, and, and I've written an entire book about that on my website at, um, at debunkingskeptics.com. That's www.debunkingskeptics.com. Um, so I, I'm totally in agreement with you on that, but but I, I still see some value in Christianity, whereas you don't. And and I think that, that you're missing the fact that Christianity exists for a reason, okay? I, I, I don't know if you believe this, but I kind of believe that everything happens for a reason. And, uh, and I get the sense that the longer you live, the more that becomes apparent, because you, the older you get, the when you analyze your experiences, you, you see this pattern emerge, and it seems like it, almost everything happens for some reason. You know, they may not be reasons that you like, but but you know, they're they're long term reasons. It it seems like 
there might be some purpose or divine order in things. But that, that's another subject, but um, I do see some value in Christianity because it, it wouldn't be around for 2,000 years if it didn't provide some value to people. I mean, it helps people. It helps them get through the day, but, but it's not purely psychological. I, I think there's metaphysical aspects of it. I mean, with some Christian people who are born again, you do see a big change in their lives. You can see it in their eyes. You can feel it in their energy, their vibe, their aura. Um, they've just become a different person um, after accepting Christ and being born again. Okay, and um, and and so there's there seems to be something very real to that. Okay, it's not just psychological or, or a delusion. I mean, a real think about it. A, a religion that's lasted for two thousand years must have some real power behind it. Okay. Because if something was a hoax, okay, I mean, say say if Jesus and Christianity were totally made up and it was a hoax, I mean, if you think about it, hoaxes don't usually last very long. They might last a few days, okay? But they don't last 2,000 years and become a, a major world religion. And, and I think Christianity is, in fact, the largest religion in the world, the most popular religion. It has the, the highest number of people in the world. So this is the world's biggest religion, and I don't think it would survive 2,000 years through so much persecution, especially in the first 300 years um, of, of Roman persecution, if it didn't have some real power behind it. And, and you know, that's, this is just common sense, and um, even as a non-Christian, I can see that, okay, because, you know, I, I don't have a chip on my sh shoulder for, for being a, an ex-Christian. I kind of appreciate what it is. You know, just the Bible, just like any other book, has some wisdom in it. It has some truth, but, you know, it also has some false teachings and some dangerous teachings and some mistakes. Because, you know, we all know the Bible was written by humans, and anything written by humans is going to have mistakes and be in imperfect and have biases and politics behind it, because that's how humans are. Humans are not perfect. They make mistakes. They have biases. And prejudices. So anything humans write will have those uh, same biases and prejudices. It's only logical, okay? And and I and I and I am sure you agree with that. But um, but I just see it for what it is. You know, it, it it works for some people. It helps them get through the day. Some people need that meaning, that purpose in life. I mean, it gives some people a purpose in life. It gave me, when I was a teenage, a teenager, it gave me a purpose in life to it. It was a crutch. It helped me get through the day. I was being persecuted at school, and, and um, I, I was suffering a lot in my soul. And so Christianity helped me get through the day. It was like a crutch for me. It, it comforted me. It was a solace to my soul. Um, but after I, I got out of school, I... I you know, no longer had any, any bullying or persecution to deal with. So I didn't really need it anymore. And, and it was at that point when I was in college that I started using critical thinking about it, um, about Christianity and seeing all the same flaws and contradictions and all the stuff that you mentioned in your books and in your videos, um, especially the book like um, Reality Check, which, you know, I really love. It's great. It's a great piece of critical thinking work, but but th like I said, there's a number of issues it seems like you only see a very small portion of, but not the whole picture, and, and you, you ignore contrary data. And, and um, another thing about Christianity is, is um, you know, I, 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 I do think there's some metaphysical power behind it, maybe divine power. Um, I, I, I mean, even if the Bible is divinely inspired, I, I forgot to say this early, even if the Bible is divinely inspired, it still has, um, it's still written by humans, and so it's still subject to mistakes and, and in, imperfections and um, biases in politics. But what I was going to say is that not only does, does Christianity have some divine or metaphysical, metaphysical power behind it, but... Um, there, there are also miracles behind it, too, and um, you can't discount that miracles happen because they are well documented, and I'm talking about sudden healings or, or you know, spontaneous healings. 
And now they don't happen to everybody, but they happen to some people. Okay, and so, you know, the fact that they happen to some people means that they're real. So, you know, and you have many documented miracles, even by the Catholic Church. Um, for example, in France, okay, there's a, a pool you can bathe in, I think, and it's called Lourdes, L-O-U-R-D-E-S, Lourdes, okay, and it's a famous pool where people bathe in, and then they get healed of, of various illnesses, and I don't think everybody gets healed there, but, you know, a lot of people do, and the Catholic Church has documented a lot of miracles, you know, in places like that, okay, a lot of people have had sudden bones heal, sudden, I don't know, miraculous cures, and there was even a good movie recently called um, Miracles from Heaven, um, starring uh, Jennifer Garner. And I think you should see it because in this movie, this little girl, she has this incurable illness. And at first it's very sad because she goes to the doctor, the hospital, and, and she undergoes, she stays there for a long time under a long treatment plan. And they, they do their best, but they can't cure her, her, her incurable illness in the stomach. So eventually, after a while, they send her home and, and um, try to make her comfortable um, because they expect her to die. So they basically send her home to die. And it's very sad. But then one day she's playing in a tree and then, then she falls down and then is knocked unconscious. And while she's unconscious, she has this near-death experience where she talks to God. And God asks if she wants to stay or go back. And she, she said, and then she says she wants to go back, but she doesn't want this incurable disease tormenting her every day. So God says, okay, I'll, I'll heal this disease for you then, and, and you'll go back and you, you'll be cured. Then when she wakes up, um, the miracle happens. Her incurable disease is, is completely gone totally gone. So this is an example of a true miracle. And again, the movie is called Miracles from Heaven. And um, um, I'll, I'll send you some ways to, to see it, you know, so you can, you know, see it for cheap or see it for free. There, there's many ways of seeing movies, of course. Um, <coughs> you can even see movies online nowadays. But this is an example of what I'm talking about, that there are unexplainable miracles. And also one time years ago in, in San Jose, California, I saw Evan, Evander Holyfield, the boxing champion. Okay, He was in this uh, San Jose church and, and talking about his testimony. And what he said was that when he became a Christian and became born again, he had this, this hole in his heart that the doctors could not heal. Okay. And when he became born again, all of a sudden, um, he, he felt this peace and, and he felt like everything was going to be all right. And, and then all of a sudden, that hole in his, in his heart suddenly sealed. So, it, you know, it was some sp spontaneous healing again. And, and um, to him, that was a miracle. It was a sign that you know, God helped him and gave him a little thank you gift for, for believing. Um. And I don't think Christianity is the only religion that has miracles. I mean, there's probably some in Islam, in Judaism, in Buddhism, in Hinduism. Okay, and um, these things happen, and so I think you should take them into account. Okay, and um, I don't know if they're supernatural or they're, they're due to spontaneous healings or whatever. I mean, spontaneous remission which is what the skeptics call it. Um, but this isn't all. I mean, there, there's more to this. I, I mean, there's also the issue of prayers being answered. And, and I saw in one of your videos, you said that when Christians pray for something and then they, it gets answered, that that would have happened anyways. But I don't agree with that because some answered prayers happen in a way that, you know, are just amazing. That wouldn't happen normally in the normal course of coincidence. Okay, or, or confirmation bias. Okay, I mean, there's so many stories. I mean, I mean, and I'm sure every devout Christian has stories of amazing 
answered prayers that have happened that are not explainable by coincidence. I mean, I remember when I was 14 or 15 and, and I, I, I was starting to take, to take Christianity seriously again. Um, I, at that time, I didn't have any Christian friends or family. So I asked God one night, um, I don't have a church to go to. I don't have any Christian friends. Can you find me some, please? Okay. And then the very next day or, or the day after, right away, it was answered. I mean, I had a friend call me that I hadn't talked to in, in about one year. And he didn't even know why he called me. And after we, we had some small talk, he discovered that I was a Christian. Then he invited me to, to his youth group church. And, and I experienced what you said, that, that great fe fellowship and camaraderie with a group, a peer group of fellow believers. I experienced that. I, I mean, we had a lot of fun and Bible study and church outings. And it was great. I was very happy with that church. And so I, so I went there for the next two years or so. And I would never have done that if that friend, that old friend, didn't call me out of the blue, just, you know, in, 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 even though we hadn't spoken to each other for a year, you know, and that doesn't usually happen, you know, I mean, and the fact that it happened right after I asked for it, after I prayed for it, I mean, that's it's quite amazing, you know, for that to just um, suddenly happen, you know, the next day after. You know, and, 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 you know, there's other stories I have like that. But the point is, you know, I don't think that's a coincidence because, you know, I, how often does an old friend call you after a year of not talking to you and, and, and suddenly answering your prayer? I mean, it just doesn't, it just doesn't seem like chance. And, and there are stories of answered prayer that are far more specific than that. I mean, I knew a guy that made a deal with God once and he said that, that, That when he met his his wife to be, he wanted a sign from God. When he met the wife that was meant to be his. He 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 would he asked God to have her say a certain phrase, a very peculiar phrase. And when he met his wife, um, when they were having dinner, and, and they were courting, she said that exact phrase that he asked God to have her say, and then they became happily married for life. So, and, and it's not a phrase that people normally say. It's not like, oh, hi, how are you, you know, or something like that. It, it's a peculiar phrase. So there, there are stories like this that are very personal and meaningful, and, and you can't just dismiss it as coincidence or something just because you don't like it. Just because you don't want there to be anything to Christianity doesn't mean you can wave your hand and, and, and pretend it doesn't exist, okay? I mean, that's not the way a truth seeker operates. It's, it's not logical. So when you do that, it seems like you have a bias. You, if you don't want to believe something, you just ignore it. And, you know, from my perspective, that's what it looks like. So, you know, I, I don't know if that's really what's going through your mind or not, and maybe I'm misunderstanding something, um, but that's just what it looks like. Um... So basically, okay, that's what I wanted to say about Christianity. Um, another thing is, oh, I, I made a list of, of what I wanted to talk about. So the next thing on the list is enlightenment and spiritual awakening. I, I saw one of your videos about enlightenment and then, and then another one about spiritual awakening where you said that you don't believe that those things are possible. Um, but that video was very vague because you didn't define what you meant by enlightenment or spiritual awakening. I mean, that's that's a very personal and subjective term. And it, if it has to do with consciousness, then, you know, that, that's something very personal. I mean, you can only speak for yourself on that. I mean, if you feel like you've never been enlightened, you can say that, but you can't speak for other people. I mean, you can't speak for me or any of the other uh, billions of people in this world that might have had some spiritual awakening experiences or enlightenment. Okay, you can't speak for other people. And so so I don't know why you acted like, oh, it's, it's an absolute fact that there's no enlightenment or spiritual awakening. I mean, you spoke about it as though it were a fact, 
like like just because you don't feel enlightened or, or haven't had spiritual awakening experiences that other people don't. I mean, you stated it as it were a fact, and that that was just your opinion. So that I believe is a major fallacy: is that that you can't take your opinions and say that they represent everybody, and and that they're a fact. No, I mean, I mean, you got to look at other people's experiences too, not just your own. Okay, and um, as far as enlightenment, I mean, the greatest philosopher of all time, Plato who lived like uh, 2,400 years ago or so. I mean, he, even he believed in the enlightenment. I mean, I'm sure you've heard, of, you've read his works and you've heard of his allegory of the cave, where, where people in the cave are watching shadows and then someone becomes enlightened when they get out of the cave and then they see the sunlight and the world above in the sun and then they see all the colors and pretty flowers um, in the sunlight and then they become enlightened and then they they go back down but the people watching the lights in the cave the candles they they don't believe him okay um so that's a metaphor for enlightenment or, or spiritual awakening and even plato the greatest philosopher of all time mentioned that so so <laughs> and and i'm sure you agree plato is a, i mean plato is a lot smarter than either of us he's <laughs> he's the greatest philosopher of all time probably and, and one of the earliest ones too. So the point is, even people that are a lot smarter and wiser and more experienced than you and I are, they talk about spiritual awakening and enlightenment. So, I mean, who are you to tell them that they're all wrong? I mean, that's kind of arrogant, you know, I mean, if you think about it, you know, if you try to do some self-reflection, I think you'll understand what I mean. Because there are so many other philosophers and spiritual teachers, and I, I know some of them you consider fake, like Eckhart Tolle, for example. But you can't really judge him that way. I, I mean, I've read Eckhart Tolle's book, The Power of Now, and some of his other books, and there's a lot of truth in there and, and meaning. And when he taught, when Eckhart Tolle talked about his awakening in the first chapter of the book, I believe it because I've had a similar experience in my life, so I know what he's talking about is possible and because I have personally experienced it, okay? Um, so I don't have a problem believing his spiritual awakening because what he describes is something that I have experienced, okay? And I've written about it before, too, in, on, on my websites. Um, but... Thing is, I mean, when I see Eckhart Tolle, he seems like a genuine guy. But now, of course, because he's successful and popular and got wealthy from his books, uh, of course, it might have gone through his head, and he he started becoming a commercial person. I mean, he started becoming commercialized and, and having to to project this guru image, like you say, this image of being perfect and, and never getting angry and all that stuff. I mean, yeah, he does project that, but. I don't think it's a hundred percent fake. It maybe it's it's fifty percent an act. Maybe it's an act, yeah, but not a hundred percent. It's maybe it's like fifty percent act. But um, but I I don't think any religion or any person is a hundred percent true or a hundred percent false. Tr truth tends to be in the middle, and people and religion tends to be a mix of truth and lies. And that's true for anything. I, I mean any any. Anything that's popular tends to have a, a, bu a bunch of truths and lies mixed in together. That's just the way it is in, in our world. Um, but you can't say that Eckhart Tolle is totally fake or an act. I think he started out being real. And he lived for a number of years with no money and, and just having people help him just because he had, a, he had a pure aura, spiritual aura about him that made people want to help him you know, according to his book. So, um, so I think he did start out being genuine, but maybe after a while, he, he when he got rich and popular, he, he started becoming commercialized, and then he started, you know, um, started going to his head, so he started playing the role of, of, a, of a commercial spiritual guru. And so he might be somewhat corrupted by that, but... Of course, anyone in his position would, would um, rationalize it somehow. He'd probably think, oh, well, I'm, I'm helping a lot of people and I'm 
telling a lot of spiritual truths. So, you know, so it, it's okay to make a living from it. You know, it, it's it's capitalism, okay? I mean, I mean, you have a right to make a living from something you're good at. I mean, why not from writing books like he does? I mean, I'm sure if you were in Eckhart Tolle's shoes and you had a chance to be famous and, and popular and make a lot of money from your books, I'm sure you would take it just like he would. I'm sure you would capitalize it on it too, right? Um, <clears throat> so, uh, I don't know, that's just a few examples, but I mean, you know, depending on how you want to define a spiritual awakening, maybe it's just an expansion of consciousness or, or a light bulb in your head, you know, you know, a lot of intellectual people and philosophical philosophers have those things. They've been well documented in books through for thousands of years. So I don't see why you want to deny all of that. You know, I mean, like I said, you can only speak for yourself. You can't speak for other people. And some of the greatest minds in history have talked about enlightenment and spiritual awakening. And who are you to say they're wrong? I mean, they're a lot smarter than you and I. Okay, and so it, it seems kind of arrogant for you to say that it doesn't exist and everyone's wrong. You know, you can't just you can't just do that. And, and I hope you consider that. Okay, I, I mean, try to put yourself in, in other people's shoes, not not just your own. I mean, you've got to try to see it from other people's perspective too. Okay, and and I know you know that that's a simple cliche, but it it just seems like in some of your videos you don't practice that. You you take this truth and then you think, oh, this is the fact. And everyone is wrong, and, and that's it. And then, and then your face looks like you're sure about that, but in reality, you can't be sure about that. I mean, I mean, you 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 say a lot of things about things that you can't possibly know, you can't possibly be sure about. I mean, even when you talk about the, the human soul or consciousness, I mean, the human soul not existing and stuff, at least not the way Christians believe it. I mean, you can't know that for sure. I mean, that's just a, a theory. You can't test it. I mean, the best thing you can say is that this is your theory and this is what you feel. But you can't say that your theory on the soul being an illusion is an absolute fact, okay? But it, in a lot of your videos, I've seen that, that you come across saying that your theory on the soul is the truth and, and the fact and the reality as though it was a hard fact, like 2 plus 2 equals 4. No, you can't, uh, about something, when it comes to something invisible that we can't explain, like consciousness or the soul, you can't be certain about anything. I mean, it's it's non-testable, it's non-falsifiable. But you seem awfully certain about it in your videos, and I don't think you can be, because, <laughs> I mean... Can't be so certain about that. I, I mean, there are different perspectives, and, and it doesn't seem like you read all the other perspectives, too. Anyways, let's move on. Uh, next thing I wanted to talk about was was your video on near death experiences and OBEs, out of body experiences. And you mentioned that you're not aware of anyone going out of body and seeing something specific that that was later verified as accurate. And uh, I'm surprised you said that because anyone who studies OBEs or NDEs knows that there are documented cases like that. For example, uh, Charles Tart, he's a famous psychologist in, in, uh, in UC Berkeley in California. He's written a lot of books, so anyone who studies parapsychology knows who, who he is. It's Charles Tart, T-A-R-T. And he's published a lot of papers and books um, about psychology and, and paranormal phenomenon and consciousness. And, and he had this girl once named Miss Z do an out-of-body, and she floated, up, she floated up in the ceiling, and then he put a, a, a number that could only be seen from the ceiling. He put it somewhere near the ceiling on, on a ledge, okay? And it was a string of numbers. And she was able to identify that those string of numbers accurately during her OBE. So that is a confirmed case of someone um, um, who saw that, um, who saw things while out of body that were later verified to be true that were very specific, in, in this case, a, f a set of numbers. Okay, so you can Google that, okay? It, it, Google Charles Tart, 
Miss Z. That's M I S S and then Z, Miss Z. Um, and, and that's just one example. Um, I'm sure there, there's a few others. Um, and uh, I, I don't know. I don't know why it seems like when you did that video on NDEs, it seemed like you made up your mind awfully quick about everything and you didn't really study any books or even see any documentaries about it because anyone who has studied NDEs knows that there are cases um, where the, the person is out of body during the near-death near experience and they see things in the operating table that are very specific that they couldn't have possibly seen that were later verified to be true. And some of these people floated outside too to, to other buildings and other houses and they saw things that were later verified to be true too. There's a number of stories about this. For example, there was a, a story um, before about, oh, about a woman who during an NDE, she um, went outside the hospital window on the, the second floor. Then, then she saw an old tennis shoe on the ledge of the, of the hospital window, right under the, the ledge. Um, it was just an old sneaker, okay? Then when she came back to her body, she described this sneaker and then they went out to look for it on the ledge and then there it was exactly as she saw it during her, her out-of-body experience, during her NDE, I mean. So, I mean, that's just, I mean, that, that, that book, I mean, that example has been published in, in books. It's been talked about in the NDE community, in the parapsychology community, it's been talked about. And there's others too. There's other examples too. And, and there's even um, cases where um, people who are born blind, who have never seen anything in their whole lives, they were born blind from birth. And they've had NDEs. And during their NDEs, they've also, they were able to see things for the first time. They were able to see people and, and rooms and, and the outside world for the first time in their lives. And they saw things two that were later confirmed, okay? There are several cases of this, and, and you can um, listen to their testimonies on YouTube, for example. Just go to YouTube and type NDEs of blind people, of, or uh, NDEs of people born blind. You can Google this or YouTube this, and, and you'll see some documented cases um, in documentaries, and in, in, in NDE journals, on NDE websites. So that something like that cannot be explained by hallucination or, or coincidence, okay? Um, yeah, so so you can't. Um, so the thing is, I'm surprised you don't know this. I, I mean, anyone who, who who's read an NDE book, I mean, even the the first book that came out, which was like in 1975 by Raymond Moody, called. Uh, life after life. That was one of the first NDE, NDE books, um, and, and it even cites examples like that. So I mean, if people in the nineteen seventies knew these things, I mean, how is it that you don't? I mean, if you don't know anything, I, I mean, I'm sure you know this, but if you don't know anything about something, you shouldn't make up your mind and jump to conclusions about it. I mean. I mean, you, I mean, you're a very intelligent guy. You know that's wrong. You know that's not logical. That's not what a good researcher does. That's not what a good truth seeker does. If you haven't studied the literature, you shouldn't make up your mind so fast. I, did, uh, I mean, you know this. This is basic common sense. So how, why, why do you do it? I don't, I don't get it. Uh, am I missing something? I mean, why, why do you jump to conclusions so quickly? And anyone who, who's interested in, in survival consciousness or NDEs or life after death, they've seen some documentaries about this. They've read maybe one or two books. And they know of these examples. So I don't understand why you don't. And if you don't, you shouldn't jump to, to conclusions about it. You know, there's a quote from Albert Einstein that says, uh, condemnation without investigation is the height of in, is the height of ignorance. So, if you don't know anything about something and then you judge it or, or condemn it or, or dismiss it as false, I mean that's ignorance according to Einstein. 
Um, so, um, so, yeah, I hope you would consider that and, and try to maybe think about this and maybe revise your theories. I think if you're a truth, if you're a real truth seeker, you should um, you, you should study all the data, all sides of the case, and, and all the other arguments, and then make up your mind. And then come to a conclusion. I mean, that's what any truth seeker does. You look at all the evidence on your side, on the other side, and then you come to a then you make up your mind. And, but in this case, you didn't do that. You didn't study all the evidence there is for NDEs being real. Okay, and, and um, you, you know, there's even a book that came out a few years ago called, um, I don't remember the name of the book, but it's by Dr. Jeffrey Long. And in his book, he cites like nine lines of evidence for NDEs, nine categories of evidence for, for the authenticity of NDEs being proof of life after death. And it was a bestseller book, um, and he has a website called the Near Death Research Foundation. No, Near Death Experience Research Foundation. That's www.nderf.org. That's the Near Death Experience Research Foundation, and you could go there and study a lot about these cases, um, and, and also see Dr. Jeffrey Long's book. That that's his website. I just gave you, and. So he has nine categories of evidence, and, and I, it's, it seems like you're probably not even aware of that because you didn't read his book or his website or even read the first book in 1975 by Dr. Raymond Moody called Life After Life. Um, so I, I just think that if you're a truth seeker, you should study all the data of the case, study the best research, and then come, come up to, with your own conclusion, you know based on all the, the data. Try to find a theory that fits all the data. Okay, Don't just dismiss 80% of the evidence and then take 20% and then draw a conclusion from that. I mean, that's, that's not the way a researcher or a truth seeker goes about it. I'm sure you know that, so why don't you do it? I mean, basic logic. Um, Another thing I wanted to talk, a related subject I wanted to talk to you about is uh, reincarnation. It seemed like when, when you said that there's no afterlife or, or no continuance of the soul, that you totally ignored the, the evidence for reincarnation too. I mean, probably you think, oh, it, it's all just false dreams or delusions. These past When people have past life memories, it's all illusions and dreams. But... There's a lot of cases where, where people with past life memories have checked it and, and verified it, and it turned out to be true, so, even some of the most minute details, and, and there are amazing stories about this. Um, geez, this is another big subject. Um, I don't know if you've heard of this researcher named Dr. Ian Stevenson, okay? He was one of the first researchers to, to study NDEs. I mean reincarnation, and um, and he went to India and some other countries and, and and he studied cases of children with past life memories who who went to visit their past lives and and everything they remember turned out to be exact, including names too, names, locations, occupations, life stories, everything. So Dr. Ian Stevenson wrote this book called 20 Cases Suggestive of Reincarnation. 20 Cases Suggestive of Reincarnation. And he documented 20 cases that had where reincarnation was the only explanation to, to explain all the data. Okay. You know, and that's a fair number, 20 cases that are strong evidence for reincarnation. Because he could not explain away these cases. And rein reincarnation was the best hypothesis that fit all the data. And he never said that reincarnation was 100% fact. He just said it was the best explanation that fit all the data. He spent many years of his life doing this. I mean, how many years of your life have you spent 
researching reincarnation, probably very little, it seems, because you don't seem to know anything about it. You don't, I mean, do you even know who Dr. Steve, Ian Stevenson is? Um, and after those 20 cases, he went on to study a lot more cases. And he's not the only one, too. I mean, in the 1990s, there was a, another groundbreaking book called Many Lives, Many Masters by um, an author named uh, Dr. Brian Weiss. He was, a, he was the chairman of the Miami Psychiatric Department or, or Miami Psychiatric Association. Okay, so he was a big name. I mean, he was a psychiatrist and, and he, he had a very good reputation and, and he, he chaired a psychiatric organization too. So Dr. Brian Weiss was a prestigious psychiatrist who, who published a lot of papers and, and he wasn't somebody who, who would normally believe in reincarnation, yet he, he met, he had some experiences during his, his hypnosis regressions and where past life memories were uncovered and, and they led to, to some details and facts that were verified upon historical research. And he wrote a book about it called Many Lives, Many Masters. I, I really suggest you read it because if you read books like these, that, that are written by sincere, credible people, then maybe you'll change your mind and maybe your view will be expanded, okay? And that book is actually a bestseller. It's a very popular book within the, um, among people who study these kind of things, people who, who study reincarnation. They've pretty much all heard of this book, Many Lives, Many Masters. So I, I, if you've never read it, I suggest you read it because it contains a lot of convincing evidence from, from a very honest, genuine guy who is also a, a prestigious psychiatrist who, um, who found a lot of evidence for reincarnation. And, and he, he was a skeptic at first and then became a believer. Um, it's a very good book. You know, and then there, there's other really f very well-documented, even televised cases of reincarnation. One is um, by Mary Sutton. Um, I forget her real name, but her past life was Mary Sutton. But she wrote a book called Many Lives, Many Masters. And um, she, she was a, a lady living in England who, who had memories, past life memories, of her children she left behind in the early 1900s when, when she died and her, her name was Mary Sutton and, and she had like eight or nine children um, over in Ireland and so one day she took a, a trip to Ireland and after a lot of research she found all her past life children with the exact same name and all of her memories checked out it's an, an amazing reincarnation story totally amazing um, it's called Across Time and Death. You know, Across Time and Death. And that is an amazing reincarnation book because the woman in it, I mean, she writes so well. I mean, the way she writes is so sincere, so honest that you just can't help but believe her and be touched by it. And all of the stuff she dreamed about in her, in her past life dreams and memories, they checked out to be real. Very, very minute details. It's one of the most amazing cases of reincarnation. And um, you can Google it. There's a few documentaries about it on YouTube, too, if you want to see it. And, and even news reports from the media. Um, so just go to YouTube and type Across Time and Death, and you'll see some um, interviews and news reports about this case, which is one of the most convincing of all. And then there's other ones. There's even some more modern from America, like the boy that remembered his past life as a World War II pilot. He even remembered his name and the, the, the other guys that flew with him in World War II when he flew the, the fighter planes. Uh, he remembered other guys that, that he was friends with during World War II that were later all found his parents when they did the research and that was on the the american tv on the news it's, it's on youtube too and there's several versions of it just just go to youtube and type um a boy remembers his past life as a pilot 
or something. It's an incredible story, and so so there's a lot of stories like that, okay, from a long time ago and more modern ones, too, of reincarnation, where these past life memories check out to be true. You know, and I've given you four or five examples that you can look up, so it seems like you didn't consider any of this. You just, you just said, oh, there's no reincarnation, there's no afterlife, there's no soul. You, you just made up your mind very fast. You didn't study any of this. I, I don't know why, um, but I, I think you should consider all of this and, and look into it. You know, I'm sure you know as well as I do that truth doesn't come on a silver platter. It doesn't come in a package like fast food. You know, to, to me, I think religion is like fast food. It, it, it's just a packaged tr set truth that might contain some truths, but it contains a lot of politics and, and, and contamination too, just like fast food does. <laughs> um, it contains a lot of artificial ingredients. Fast food, I mean. So fast food religion and fast food food contain a lot of artificial ingredients. I'm sure we would both agree with that, but the thing is, truth doesn't come on a, on a platter or in a package. And so it's something you got to dig for. It's something you got to spend your time to, to research and dig for. You can't just sit around and think for a few minutes and then make up your mind, oh, there's no laughter life, there's no human soul. You can't just sit around and come up with that conclusion. you got to research the stuff I'm telling you about, too, you know. So I, I, <clears throat> I was wondering why you didn't or, or why you don't, and maybe you're aware of some of these stories, but you decided to dismiss them for some reason. I don't know why. But you should know as well as I do that you can't just wave your hand and dismiss what you don't like. Reality doesn't work that way. Okay. Um... See, the next thing I wanted to talk about, oh, uh, the demon possession thing. You mentioned in the video that you didn't believe in demon possession and that you, 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 you thought it was all in a delusion, but you didn't give any reasons why. You just, again, you just jumped to, to a conclusion. And, I mean, did you interview any, any of the priests who, who did exorcisms or casted out any demons? I don't think you did. I mean, did you read their books? Some people who were... I mean, did you know the, the, the movie The Exorcist? That was based on a true story. And during true stories like that, I mean, you don't just have someone who acts possessed. You have objects flying around the room. You have things moving. Now that, just like in your psychokinesis thing, but, but, in a, lot more, but a lot more extreme. Now that may be due to um, that might be due to psychokinesis or maybe poltergeist activity. That's another explanation. But I mean, there are things about it you can't explain. And and these when you meet someone who's really demon possessed, you can feel the sense of that demon. Okay. Um, and. There's a guy that, that, on a related subject, there's a guy that has some interesting videos about this. But he doesn't call them demons, he calls them archons. So the, the conspiracy or the truth movement is now talking about this. But, you know, some of them are Christians and they, call it, they use the word demons, but others use the word archons because, I don't know if you know this, but archons is... is uh, a-R-C-H-O-N-S. I mean, A-R-C-H-O-N-S, yeah, archons. They are beings that were mentioned in the Christian Gnostic texts. And I don't know if you read any of the Gnostic books, the Gnostic Gospels, but some of them mention the archons and they're parasitic entities that feed off of human pain and negativity and suffering. And they sometimes possess people too, especially the elite. So they can control the world by possessing the most powerful people, which is the most logical course of action for them. They want to control the world, that is. And, and you've mentioned that in some of your videos, too, that, that 
if the occult is real, then then the people that would be doing it are, are the people in in power because they have a need for it. Okay, they they would be in the best position for it. But anyways, the guy's name that that talks about these archons. Well, there's several guys. Even David Icke talks about him now. But there, there's an interesting guy I want you to listen to. His name is Robert Stanley. Okay, and Robert Stanley, um, he has his own podcast and website too. But what he says about these archons is really interesting. And he's talked to some psychiatrists about them too. And so demons might be archons or archons might be demons. I don't know. It depends on who you listen to. And then in, in Islam, they're called the the jinn, the jinn, which is like D J I N N, and that's the Muslim, the Muslim form of a demon is is the D jinn. Um. But what Robert Stanley said that was interesting about them when he talked to the psychiatrist is that when you go to a psychiatric ward and, and talk to schizophrenics or, or people who hear voices, okay. Um, what's interesting is that psychiatry says that people who hear voices are just he hearing random hallucinations due to some biochemical imbalance, okay? And that's the official position of psychiatry. However, um, the interesting thing about this is that that doesn't explain one thing, which is why is it that when people hear voices, um, like schizophrenics, for instance, why is it that those voices are almost always negative? If they were random hallucinations due, due, to, due to chemical imbalances in the brain, okay, then you would expect it to be about 50% positive and 50% negative. You know, but, but you wouldn't expect it to be 100% negative, okay? I mean, if the voices are 100% negative, then I don't think it's due to random hallucinations or chemical imbalances, like psychiatry says. Okay, and so that was a very good point that Robert Stanley and the psychiatrist he was talking to made. So it seems like these voices, if they're always negative 100% of the time almost, it seems like these voices are, um, are more likely to be entities whether you want to call it demons or, or mind parasites or energy parasites or energy vampires, there's different names for them. It seems like that's what they do, okay? And um, especially since, you know, they give you unwanted thoughts. Like if, if you don't feel like your thoughts are your own or if your thoughts are unwanted, then they can't be your thoughts. They're probably thoughts from someone else. I mean, I don't know. Maybe they're thoughts from your subconscious mind or something. But um, uh, either way, I mean, this is some interesting evidence that might suggest that there are um, demons or mind parasites or energy parasites that infect your mind and, and feed off of negativity and will give you unwanted thoughts. And those unwanted thoughts are usually always negative. They're not 50% positive and 50% negative like you would expect in an hallucination. So that's something to consider. Um, so I would recommend um, watching some of Dr. Robert Stanley. Um, well, he's not a doctor, but I would definitely recommend watching some of his videos. His name is Robert Stanley. That's S-T-A-N-L-E-Y. Okay, like, like the Stanley Cup. Robert Stanley, and um, he has a lot of interesting videos and interviews and podcasts about this. Um, he's even he's even been on Coast to Coast before, so I would suggest researching that and um, considering it. It's, in, it's very interesting whether you believe it or not. And I know I'm making a ton of suggestions about all this stuff to research, and it's going to take many hours, maybe months to research all of this, but I just think you should be more well informed before you jump to conclusions, okay? And that's my main message. Okay, um, 
And as, and you mentioned in some of your videos that you don't believe Satan exists. Um, again, when it comes to something invisible or something up there, you can't be 100% certain about it. I mean, you can't say for sure that Satan exists or not, okay? Because you can't test this hypothesis. You can't see him. You can't go up into heaven or to other dimensions to see if there's a Satan or not. So I don't know why you're so sure that there's no Satan. You, you, you talk about it as though you're very confident that Satan doesn't exist. And I don't think that's fair. You can't, you can't know something that you don't know, okay? So I don't understand why there's that attitude. And, and, and whether Satan exists or not, I do think there's dark entities or dark beings. Because logically, if there are beings of light, then there should be beings of darkness. I mean, everything is defined by its opposite. Just like in that Chinese wheel with the yin-yang, the black and the white. Okay? Um, everything is defined by its opposite and... and, and Everything cannot exist without its opposite. Just like sickness cannot exist without health. Good cannot exist without bad. Light cannot exist without dark. Up cannot exist without down. Left can't exist without right. So everything exists you know, in a polar um, stream of opposites. Okay, so... Um, so based on that, okay, logically, it logically follows then that if, if there are entities or angels or beings of light, which some people see, that there would be entities or beings of darkness too. Just like if there's a good, there's a bad, okay? Um, everything has an opposite and cannot exist without its opposite. We know this in, in basic Taoism. Okay, in basic philosophy, too. So it makes sense for there to be a Satan or at least some dark entities out there. And, and I don't think you just you can just dismiss it by waving your hand just because you, you just because you don't want to believe in Satan doesn't that's not a reason to declare that he doesn't exist. OK, because you can't know that. OK, and, and just because you don't want to believe something doesn't mean you should just dismiss it and say it doesn't exist. I mean, that's not. What a truth seeker does. It doesn't it's not logical, okay. And I just wanted to make that point because I think it's important. Okay, so what's next on the list? Oh uh the Illuminati and the New World Order. This has gone quite a long time, longer than I expected, by the way. It's almost an hour already on this video, so um, I hope you've gotten this far already, because I, I hope Everything I'm telling you is, is sincere from my heart and, and honest, as you can tell. And, and I know you know I'm an honest person, and, and I, I never bullshit anyone. You can see that from my voice, my body language, okay? I, I'm just as sincere as you are, so I hope you've gotten this far, even though it's been an hour already. Uh, okay, I guess one of the last things I wanted to talk about was the Illuminati and the New World Order. And you made one or two videos about this, and then at first you admitted that all these secret symbols, like the pyramid and the all-seeing eye, w w was evidence for some secret cabal or, or, or secret society. And then, and then in another video, you said that the Illuminati does, does not exist, and that you don't think it does. But I don't see how you can say that, because in the last 10 years, there's been a lot of evidence coming out that the Illuminati does exist. The New World Order exists for sure. Whether it, it succeeds or not is another story, but the plot is there. It's been well documented. It's been well confessed. It's in books by, by high-level insiders. <laughs> Even politicians have been talking about it. You can't deny that there's a New World Order plan. Okay, I mean, Alex Jones might exaggerate about a lot of things, and David Icke too, but... When they talk about the New world, world Order, that is a truth. That is a fact. It's well documented. And the plan does exist, okay? But you can, So you can't just dismiss it all. I mean, come on. <laughs> come on, I, really, I mean... Um, <laughs> that, and as far as the Illuminati, I mean, 
that's been well documented for at least 250 years, okay? And there are a number of historians from the late 1700s that have documented it. And then some from the 1800s and 1900s too. So, I mean, you act like the Illuminati is this, this theory, this boogeyman that, that people talk about, but there's no evidence for it. And that's not true because there... There are documents about it. I mean, I mean, I'm sure you've heard of it, but in, in 1776, there was a man named Adam Weishaupt who started the Bavarian Illuminati. And supposedly that was, was discovered and then, then it was disbanded, but conspiracy people say that it went underground and it infiltrated the Freemasons and the, the Catholic Church, the government, um, but that's not just a theory. Some really good historians have documented that. For example, in this in the seven, late 1790s, there was a guy named John Robinson, and he he got a hold of the the teachings of Adam Weishaupt, the literature that that was discovered. I mean, this, the story goes: one of the Illuminati couriers was riding on horseback, and then and then he was struck by lightning, and then someone found all these papers to to saw the plans to overthrow the monarchy and then they turned it over to the police and then all of a sudden all the monarchies of Europe discovered the Illuminati and then they, they made they outlawed it so it had to go underground um, but the thing is whether it went underground or not their plans have come true they wanted, wanted to abolish the monarchy which they did with the American Revolution the French Revolution and the Communist Revolution and other revolutions abolished the monarchy, they've turned people away from religion so that they start worshipping science and atheism and money and materialism. They've accomplished that. They've broken up the nuclear family. Um, they, they've destroyed traditional values, you know, at least in the West. Everything the Illuminati has uh, uh, talked about Adam, Adam Weishaupt talked about it, has come true pretty much. So whether they carried out this plan or another group, the agenda was real and, and it seems like it's manifested. Um, but anyways, the historian John Robinson wrote about this. He documented what Adam Weishaupt said and he revealed the plot. And then he published a book about it called Proofs of a Conspiracy. And I don't know if you know this, but a copy of that book was sent to George Washington when, when, when Washington was retired from his presidency. And George Washington read it and said um, he admitted that the Illuminati and, and the doctrines of Jacob, Jacob, Jacobinism uh, had already spread to America and, and possibly infiltrated the Freemason society. So Washington admitted this in his letters that the Illuminati was real, and it, it, it came to America and it possibly infiltrated the Masonic Brotherhood. So even George Washington said this, and, and his letter saying this is in the Library of Congress, and um, I've posted the link to that in some of your videos, and, and I'll send it to you too. It's on my website too. So you can uh, see this. So even a credible man like George Washington admits the Illuminati is real. And then after that, there was another historian named Abel Barrio, A-B-B-E-L, and Baru is B-A-R-R-E-U. And he wrote a book on the French Revolution, several books actually, and one of them was called Code of the Illuminati, in which he documents from, from interviewing people that the Illuminati, Illuminati had infiltrated Freemasonry, and then they, they hatched the, free, the plot for the French Revolution from these free Masonic lodges. So he talked to a lot of people who were involved in the French Revolution, who said this, who, who, who could verify this, that just like in the American Revolution, it was hatched, the plot for the revolution was hatched up in, in, in the free Masonic lodge. It wasn't a random uprising like... like uh, American histor histor historical books tell you. Okay. 
There was no random uprising. That that's a myth created by and a cover up created by Western history. Okay, so and it was the same thing in the American Revolution too. I don't know if you know this, but the American Revolution, like the Boston Tea Party, it was hatched hatched up in in a tavern called the the Green Tavern Lodge, and that was a well known place um, for free Freemasonic members to to meet and congregate and make plans from. In fact, that tavern, the Green Tavern, was owned by the Freemasons. So it's well documented that the Freemasons had a hand in starting this uh, the American Revolution. And even the History Channel talks about that too. In several documentaries about the Founding Fathers, it talks about how they met in the Green Tavern and how the Freemasons helped start the American Revolution. Maybe they were behind the whole thing. I don't know, but um, but they definitely played a role in it, and the French Revolution too. You already have two historians in the 1790s that have documented the Illuminati and how they've started revolutions, how they've infiltrated the Freemasons and the government, and maybe the Catholic Church too, and the Jesuits. So. This is all historically documented. I mean, you mentioned Mark Dice in some of your videos. Mark Dice documents this in his books, too. He names these exact books that I just told you about. So if you ever read any of Mark Dice's books, how, how do you not know this? I don't get it. I, I mean, you seem very well-educated, very smart, very deep, very sincere. How do you not know this? If you read Mark Dice's books, you should know the, this documentation. So, the Illuminati is something documented, okay? And it's very likely that either it or some version of it continued on. Um, and then in, in 1924, you have a book called by Nesta Webster, who, who was a very brilliant scholarly uh, British historian. And she wrote a book called Secret Societies and Subversive Movements. And um, I, I, I downloaded a copy of that. And by the way, all these books I'm telling you about from, from the 1790s and the one by Nesta Webster, um, they're all available for free online if you want to Google them. So there's no excuse not to read them or look at them because they're available free online. You don't even have to buy it from Amazon. Even if you have an Amazon Kindle, you don't have to buy it from Amazon. It's pretty much free even on Amazon Kindle. You can download a free copy. There's, so there's no proof. I mean, there's no excuse not to read these books. They're online for free. So Nesta Webster wrote Secret Societies and Subversive Movements. And, um, and it documents the Illuminati too, as well as a bunch of other conspiracies. It's a very scholarly book, and, and I'm, I'm sure if you look at it, you'll be very impressed. Even though it's written in 1924, I mean, it's so good, you know. A lot of books were, were in the past like this were better, because there, in, the, in the 1800s and early 1900s, there were a lot of very talented writers, I'm sure you know. Um, and Nesta Webster is one of them. But because she exposed a lot of conspiracies, obviously the government doesn't want you to read stuff like that. But it's a very scholarly book. It talks about secret societies in the past, ancient history, uh, modern secret societies, revolutions, and, and how they connect and relate. I mean, it, it's all a big subject, a very big volume. Um, but I suggest you look into it sometime. And she mentions the Illuminati, the Freemasons, even the Zionists and the Jews, especially the, the elite cabal of, of Zionists that wrote the book. Um, the, what is that called? Oh, the, 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 the Protocols of the Learned, Learned Elders of Zion. Yes, the Protocols of Zion. Okay. I'm sure you've heard that book. It, it, <clears throat> it's supposed to be like a... Uh, a world domination manual for, for Jews, okay? Or at least for elite Jews, which call themselves Zionists. And 
Most people think it's a forgery, and it might be, okay? It might just be rhetoric, but the, the key important thing is that, and everyone that's read it will tell you this, is that what's predicted in the Prodigals of Zion, which was, was written in the early 1900s, okay? It was written a long time ago in the early 1900s. But everything it predicted pretty much has come true, pretty much. And so whether it's a forgery or not, Whoever wrote it knew what was to come in the 20th century, and it has come. So whoever wrote it obviously has insider knowledge. He knew what the plan was for the elite. And in this case, it's a group of, of Jewish elites called the Zionists. Um, and, and, you know, I'm not trying to encourage you to be anti-Semitic here, but, you know, the Zionists are very real, and they're a group of powerful Jews that... <laughs> Um, they're a group of, of powerful Jews that um, control a lot of the Western world. The politics, the media, the banking, and, and, and the lobbies from Israel. And so, uh, so if you look at that, I mean, that, that's kind of proof of a conspiracy, too. So, um, and then in 1945, you have a book called Occult Theocracy by Edith Starr Miller, which also goes into detail about secret societies, past and present. And, and, um, and she, she was married to somebody in the, in the British aristocracy. So she was married to people, to, some, to a, someone from the elite class. So she lived among elite circles in Britain and was part of the aristocracy. So she... You know, she was privy to a lot of the knowledge about secret societies and other s secrets that powerful people know. That's another interesting book. And then, and then in the seventies, you have a book called uh, uh, "None Dare Call It a Conspiracy" by Gary Allen. None dare call it a conspiracy, and that one documents um, a conspiracy too—a conspiracy of liberalism, socialism to to. Create communism and all that stuff, and and that was another groundbreaking book because no one had written a conspiracy book for a while. Um, and then then you had oh, and before that you had Eustace Mullins. He exposed the Federal Reserve, a lot of lies about American history. Um, he exposed a lot of conspiracies. That's Eustace Mullins, E U S T A C E, and then Mullins, M U L L I N S. And he's written some books and did a lot of interviews and lectures, and he's considered one of the early scholars in the 20th century about conspiracies because he's been researching this since the 1940s. So um, he's one of the earliest authorities in the 20th century for that. So you should re really research some of this. Um, uh, what else? Oh, and then you, you have uh, Dr. Carol Quigley, which was, he was a mentor of Bill Clinton. His name is Dr. Carol Quigley, and he also hung out with elite insiders and, and secret society groups, like the CFR, the Council on Foreign Relations. And he wrote a book about a thousand pages long called Hope and Tragedy. And in it, he documents that, yes, there is an Anglo-American New World Order conspiracy to, to create a world government. But he thinks it's a good thing, not a bad thing, the only qualm he has about it is that he doesn't agree that it should be kept secret from everyone. He, he believes that it should be transparent and open, the, the plan for a new world order government. He believes that it should be open, not, not kept hidden. But he thinks it's a good thing. Um, but he's one of the elite insiders who, who have whistleblown and revealed the plot. His book is called Hope and Tragedy by Dr. Carol Quigley. So, you know, that's another documented insider source. And, and there's, there's, you know, there's a lot since then, you know, but you get the idea. I mean, there, there, are, there is a lot of evidence for conspiracies, Illuminati, New World Order. I, mean, I, I don't know why you're not aware of it. Um, I just hope you'll research some of this and, and, and um, consider it because it seems like you're not either not aware of it or you don't want to be aware of it. So you dismiss it from cognitive dissonance. But I hope you consider all that I say and, and try to maybe revise, research some of this stuff maybe and try to update maybe some of your views in the future. 
or revise some of your views if you feel fit to, to do so. So anyway, I just hope you consider all of this. And um, if you're a person who, one more thing, if you're a person who studies philosophy, I suggest you you read some of the books by by Manly P. Hall. Manly P. Hall was is considered the greatest philosopher of the 20th century. And he founded the, the Philosophical Society in Los Angeles, which you can visit today. So he's one of the greatest philosophers in history, and, and definitely in the 20th century, he's the greatest. And, and um, he wrote a book called the, the, the Secret Teaching of All Ages, which is like the first book to, to talk about everything. Secret societies, ancient history, the occult, theology, religion, everything all into one. It's like a synthesis. It's like a theory of everything in the occult world. Um, I don't know if you've heard of it, but a lot of truth seekers have a copy of it. You can you can you can download a e an internet a PDF copy of it if you want to. It's free now, um, or, or an Amazon Kindle copy of it. But I suggest you r research him sometime because you've never mentioned him, and I thought maybe. If you researched him, you might learn some stuff about him from him because he has a lot of esoteric knowledge. Um, and, and because of his knowledge, the Freemasons made him an honorary 33rd degree Freemason too. So that's somebody you can look into. He has a lot of lectures that are on YouTube that were recorded. Um, so just type his name, Manly P. Hall. Um, so that's something you might want to look into sometime if you want to learn more about everything. Um, and maybe he'll revise some of your beliefs. Maybe he'll expand some of your beliefs. Anyways, thanks for listening to this. My phone is running out of battery, so I guess I'll end here. And hope I've given you, given you something to think about and research. And if you have time, I'd appreciate a response to some of these things. I, I know I've talked about a lot of things, and it might take a long time to respond to all of them, but... I hope, you know, you might find some time to respond to some of them at least someday because these are all honest suggestions that I wanted to, to share with you from my heart, from my mind. Um, okay, well, thanks for your videos and keep up the good work and I hope you've enjoyed my video. Okay, um, take care, Daryl Sloan, and, and um, have a good day. Bye-bye.